He was a two-sport athlete with a one-track mind. He had a purpose in life. I knew I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to be rich. You've all seen the glory. Neon Dion saluting as he goes. But don't nobody know the story. Dion Sanders was a man determined to escape the poverty of his past. Somebody convinced him, hey, Dion, you can make a lot of money if you sell yourself, and that's exactly what he did. He transformed himself into a larger-than-life figure called Primetime. Look at me. As Primetime, Dion got everything he wanted, both on and off the feet. My thing was having sex with many women. You know, I didn't discriminate. He would call and say, hey man, what you doing? I said, nothing. He said, but I'm taking a bath. Y'all say hi. <laughs> you know, and I, I need a permission slip from Dion to tell y'all some of the things. But Dion's fame came with a price. <laughs> Fame works two ways. I'll pay you and you pay me. You are a real man, Dion, I'll say that. We don't just tolerate, we celebrate people for acting like egotistical, obnoxious horses' asses. Primetime was, was slowly killing Dion Sanders. Wild ways cost him his wife, his children, and his will to live. I got in that car and drove off that cliff and got to the bottom of that fall off and was still alive. I'm like, Lord, you saved me. And that was something. Now, he's found a higher power. This is a man who has everything contemplating. Is tomorrow worth it? I'm a blessed woman to say that I have a very God-fearing man and he's walking in the way in which God called him to. And I support that wholeheartedly. This is Deion Sanders, Beyond the Glory. Hallelujah! <laughs> Absolutely outstanding. Unbelievable. I reported that he bet on baseball. Do you have anything to say to your fans? To millions of fans, Deion is a swaggering Superman who's thrived in the spotlight. He's captivated fans with dazzling catches, clutch hits, and open field dashes. Could be intercepted and in by Deion Sanders. Sanders hits one hard to right field, way back into the right field seats. And he's done it all in brash, high-stepping style. But along the road to fame and fortune, Dion's dreams turned into nightmares. The night we won the Super Bowl in San Francisco, I was the first one out of the locker room, the first one home, the first one to bed. And I said, this, it ain't what I thought it was. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even happy. Despite two Super Bowl trophies and millions in the bank, Dion was on the brink of suicide. You got women everywhere, you still ain't happy. You got clothes galore, you still ain't happy. You, you got everything you wanted, but you're still not happy. In the spring of 97, on a dark Ohio road, Dion was driving on a suicide mission, wondering what people would say about him when he was gone. I got on my knees and said, Lord, if you take me, take me, please take me right now. I, I can't go no farther. Lord, just take me. Dion Sanders grew up living with his mother and sister in a public housing project in Fort Myers, Florida. A neighborhood so riddled with crime, it came with its own jail. The police decided to put a police substation right inside the project so they could take him to jail right there in the project. And they put barbed wire all around. It's sort of like a prison. Dion saw the pain and misery of the projects from close range. His father, Daddy Buck, who left the family when Dion was a child, was frequently unemployed and addicted to drugs. My biological father, Daddy Buck, he used drugs. I've seen him with needles, people in this room shooting up, and those are the reasons why I've never chosen to drink or smoke in the entirety of my life. Many nights, you know, uh, we lay up in the bed and we talk, you know, and I explain to him, you know, that 
Your dad is gone, but I'm here for you. A lot of times we cry, but we made it. The Huxtables aren't real. You know, an African American family is uh, really. I, I I don't I don't know anyone who whose father is a, a doctor, the mother's a lawyer. I don't. We didn't grow up like that. With his father gone, Dion's mother Connie took work cooking and cleaning at a local hospital to hold the family together. I had to work two jobs in order to make it, you know, because I was a single parent. My mother, she served as everything. She was all that in a bag of chips. When you work hard like that, it's very hard on the kids too. Because you see your children, but not like you want to see them. He grew up fast because he had to learn to stay by himself. Left on his own after school, Dion soon found trouble. When he was seven, he had his first run-in with the police. You know a child is going to throw rocks, and I could throw a rock. I could throw a rock like a skeet shoot. It was an old house in the graveyard, a bounded house. I was throwing rocks, and I was winning, breaking all the windows, and someone called the police. They was telling me that they had Dion at the post station. I said, my, my Dion? I said, yes, Dion Sanders. Dion's mom wanted to teach her young son a lesson he wouldn't forget. She told the police to keep him. By the time I got there, all the other parents had picked their sons up. Dion was the only one left. And he, looking with his big eyes, he said, Ma, Ma, I thought you had forgotten me. My mama belt should be in the Hall of Fame from that day. Determined to keep her young son off the streets, Connie enrolled nine-year-old Dion in Pop Warner football. When he came on my football team, he only weighed about 85 pounds. He had skinny little legs, but he could run like a deer. For Dion, football wasn't just a game. It was a chance to escape the projects. Pop Warner coach David Cable was determined to help. I think a lot of his drive came from where he grew up, knowing that where he lived, and if he continued, but most of his friends were in, were in jail from selling drugs. High peer pressure really was having weight around your neck, flossy. You know, having car with the boom and, 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 and having the nice threads. That was high peer pressure. I explained to Dion back there that these kids would be out selling it, or you could be out selling it, make extra money. You don't want to get involved in it all, because if you do, you're going to end up in jail. With Dion playing Pop Warner football, his father, Daddy Buck, took a selfish interest in his son's games. Dion was only 10. But Daddy Buck would come and bet on the game, especially when we played against our rivals. They come in there, baby, betting on Pop Warner football. Baby boy, I need three out you today. I got about 100 laying on the line. And I used to sit up down there, you know, man. but I would deliver. By the time Dion entered North Fort Myers High School, he was starring in three sports, football, basketball and baseball. He played a sport every season so that he didn't have to go home and be around what was happening in his neighborhood. As a high school quarterback, a young Dion proved himself as a runner, a passer, and a scrapper. On defense, as a safety, he made a career of getting between the receiver and the ball. Dion's reputation grew along with his dreams. After games, he would drive his mom past large houses on the rich side of town. He told her of his plans to use sports to build them both a better life. My mother always took me outside my neighborhood so I could really see life. So I could say, Mom, we're going to have a house bigger than that one day. He said, Mom, one of these days, I'm going to build you a house just like it. I said, yeah, right. Dion soon had an opportunity to make his dreams come true. In 1985, as he graduated from high school, the Kansas City Royals offered him the quick road to riches. $75,000 to play minor league baseball. Dion was planning to go to college. But for a poor kid from the projects, it was a tempting offer. Coming up, the birth of primetime. It was sort of like taking a bit of Ali and incorporating him into your life. And I think that's what I did. And later, primetime takes matters into his own hands. This, you are a real man, Dion, I'll say that.
As a poor kid from the projects, Deion Sanders had used school sports to steer clear of drugs and crime. But now at the age of 18, as he graduated high school, he was facing new temptations. The Kansas City Royals were offering the quick road to riches, just as Florida State had offered Deion a free ride to college. He thought if they can offer him 75000 he could make even much more if he'd go to college. I believe in me like no other. If you don't believe in yourself, ain't nobody else will. And he said, Ma, I think I'm going on to school. In the summer of 1985, Dion chose to attend Florida State. By the end of his first year, he was making a name for himself in three sports, football, baseball, and sometimes track. Our track coach asked him, will you run in one of our meets? Oh yeah, I'll run in one of your meets. So he goes over and runs in the meet and whips world-class sprinters. <laughs> Deion Sanders deals at the 11, 15 it is. By his sophomore year, Dion had sealed his reputation as someone to watch. But the ambitious 19-year-old wanted much more. So Dion created a character he felt would distinguish him from the rest of the pack, Prime Time. Somebody convinced him, hey, Dion, you can make a lot of money if you sell yourself, and that's exactly what he did. Stealing a page from the School of Corporate Marketing, Dion created a character and gave it a nickname. He began wearing gold chains and giant rings. Dion drove around campus in his new Chrysler convertible with personalized primetime license plates, talking on his cell phone, all courtesy of his hard-working mother, Connie. The top cornerback in college football hoped primetime would help draw crowds and ticket sales, convincing big league scouts to write him big league checks. He said, Ma, he said, cornerbacks isn't making any money. He said, I got to do something to make plenty of money. Because he always used to always say, a closed mouth is never fed. And he just created a monster. But the primetime monster was more than just clothing. Primetime was also an attitude. An attitude Dion created based on his four favorite sports idols. Muhammad Ali, because I love his brashness, but he backed it up. Hank Aaron for the way he endured those trials and tribulations of the racism. O.J. Simpson, he was the juice. He took care of his life and who took care of him. Dr. J, Julius Irving, the constant professional, the business life, but he had the flair for the dramatics. He was thinking ahead. He said, I just can't intercept the ball and run out of bounds. I got to intercept it and I got to high step, I got to throw the arms in there, I got to do something so that the attention is on me. Fans went wild and broadcasters couldn't get enough. Sanders like a jet across midfield. To the 40, still on his feet. This is why they call him primetime. Primetime is, you know, the athlete who says it's time to put on the show, it's time to give my all, give the people all that they want. In the stadium, everyone hollering prime time, prime time is always oh, just outrageous, it's exciting. On a lesser athlete, prime time would have failed miserably, but Dion had the game to back up his bravado. In 1986, his third year at Florida State, he became a college football All-American. The previous spring, he'd led Florida State's baseball team into the College World Series. Professional scouts took notice. Only a junior in college, the New York Yankees paid Dion $75,000 to play three months of minor league baseball. Because Dion was still attending Florida State, it was the first taste of real money, and it changed the way he looked at things. Oh, you look up there like it's six points. Touchdown over Dion. I look up there like it's a million dollars. But Dion's success was not limited to the playing field. In the summer of 1987, primetime was taking on a life of its own. Women loved the character, including the woman he would fall in love with and eventually marry. He had on all this jewelry and had his hat turned to the back. And he said, you looking for me? Baby, you looking for me? And I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm primetime. I said, well, who is primetime? Carolyn Chambers was a psychology major at nearby Florida A&M. She soon learned who Primetime was. He gave me his number, and I didn't call him the very next day. I waited a day, so <laughs> when I called him, I, we spoke, and he came right over. And 
From that day he came over, we were together every day after that. When his final college football season began, Dion became the team captain, leader, and mentor. I had power amongst the team where they came to me with, with problems or with the drama in their life. When they needed some money, I kept $5,000 on me at all times. A little bank roll and I always broke them off. And I worked my butt off and I was very successful. Dion's success became the Seminole's success. He won the Jim Thorpe Award as the nation's best cornerback and led Florida State into the Sugar Bowl. On the final play, Dion intercepted a pass in the end zone. The Seminoles won the game. It was a storybook ending to his college football career, but the same couldn't be said of his scholastic career. After the game, Dion walked away from college without a diploma. I think when it came right down to it, there were enough pro scouts that convinced him that he was going to be a very, very high choice, draft choice, and be a wealthy man. The scouts were right. In the summer of 1988, Dion was drafted in the first round by the Atlanta Falcons and signed for more than $4 million. He was now the highest paid defensive back in NFL history. Though he lacked a diploma, he graduated to the big leagues. Primetime was ready for his close-up, but Deion Sanders would never be the same. Well, all right. Coming up, Deion Sanders in the spot, developing a seven-figure attitude. Back off. Back up. Back up. Don't call him. It must be the money that's turning them on. Must be the money. I cannot go wrong. And later, the walls come tumbling down. I hadn't slept in three days. I hadn't eaten in three days. And I was just dwindling away. You're watching Deion Sanders, Beyond the Glory. In 1985, as a high school football and baseball star, Deion Sanders refused offers to turn pro after he graduated, and instead went to Florida State to play college football. What a return by Deion Sanders! Now in the fall of 1989, Deion's investment in college was paying huge dividends. He'd become one of America's first professional two-sport athletes. I played two sports because I played three sports all my life. It was nothing different. I wasn't going to let America tell me, oh, you can only play one sport. I wasn't going to let people say, you could only do one thing. He was making millions as the highest paid defensive player ever in the NFL, playing cornerback for the Atlanta Falcons. At the same time, Dion signed a deal making several hundred thousand dollars playing center field for the New York Yankees. It was truly remarkable and admirable that he was able to be as good a baseball player as he was. It was a great moment in my life to think that this world is set up where anybody could be successful. With the money from his first Atlanta Falcons football paycheck, Dion made good on a high school promise to his mother. He bought her a house on the rich side of town. It was exciting. I, all I could do was cry. Then, Dion tried to help his father, Daddy Buck, pick up the pieces of his life. I was making sure he was taken care of, uh, nice clothes on his back, money in his pocket, bank account. You know, no one wants their father on drugs, you know, so he wanted him clean. Although not rapping professionally, Dion had recently grown friendly with another flamboyant entertainer, rapper MC Hammer. At Dion's request, Hammer agreed to hire Dion's father to work on his road crew. All I wanted was a, an environment uh, for him that kept him busy, that kept him happy. Dion also started a family of his own. In 1990, after two years together, Dion's college sweetheart, Carolyn, gave birth to Dion's daughter, Deandre. Despite the demands of his two-sport schedule, Dion always found a way for the new family to be together. We did everything together. We had never been apart. Even when DeAndre was born, two days later, he told the doctor she had to come here. So DeAndre was two days old, and we had to fly to New York when he was playing with the Yankees. Dion took his primetime character with him to New York as well. And while Carol and DeAndre were warmly received, Dion's alter ego was not. You know, we had an older veteran club, and, and 
They weren't very receptive to a young guy like Dion coming in with his gold. It didn't take long before primetime was getting Dion into trouble. During a Yankees White Sox game in New York, primetime walked up to the plate, cleared an area in the batter's box, and drew an S with two lines in it, a dollar sign in the dirt. Hall of Fame catcher Carlton Fisk was outraged at Dion's crass commercials and decided to draw a line of his own. He turned the bat around and made the dollar sign mark. Well, you know, that uh, that would upset people, obviously. And here comes the bullpen. <laughs> I have no idea what started that thing off. After the incident, Dion played out his contract.